Greetings everyone. My name is Doug Chapman. I'm a regional extension agent in uh, North Alabama. I work with commercial horticulture. <clears throat> and what I wanted to talk to you about uh, today is just some vegetables that uh, I consider to be heirloom vegetables. These are uh, regional favorites. Uh, they are grown here in the southeast for a reason and I'll try to explain some of that as we go along but uh, you know uh, we have a different climate here it's uh, very hot and humid during the summertime and a lot of the traditional vegetables that are grown in uh, some other parts of the world just don't perform really very well here uh, and it's because of our climate. Um, as we go along, I'll try to think of some questions that you might have uh, and try to answer them as we go. So with that said, we'll go ahead and jump off into this. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, be born during a time uh, that was just after World War II and uh, the Korean War. And the neighborhood I grew up in uh, was uh, almost every house. There was a World War One, World War Two, or Korean War veteran, and all of these people uh, grew up uh, during the Depression. They they knew what hard times were, uh, but uh, in a lot of respects, uh, times had been really hard in the South for. For a long time but my point to all this is that uh, everybody had a garden and I mean everybody grew something uh, this is uh, a picture that I actually took in 1964 this might have been my first camera that I ever had uh, but uh, Mr. T.A. Perkins is standing there by his garden that Mr. Bill Anders has just broken up for him and so as you can tell this is uh, in the springtime there's not very many leaves on the trees yet and so he's getting ready to plant. Uh, Mr. Perkins was a uh, uh, really a uh, good neighbor. Uh, he and his wife both and they uh, they grew up during some really hard times and uh, one of the few people that I knew that uh, actually had a root cellar. I remember going down in it and it was covered in glass and uh, it was just a, a pit that had been dug out and they kept uh, canned vegetables and some things down in there. But uh, by the time I came along that had, uh, we had started using freezers a lot. Uh, you know, people had gotten electricity as you can see from the utility lines here and so uh, times were changing a little bit but uh, people still live the way they remembered how to live and that was uh, during some really hard times. Now just uh, take a good look at this photo here and I'm going to show you what this area looked like back in the 1920s uh, on another slide a little bit later on. Uh, one of the vegetables that uh, we uh, were able to grow here in the south uh, was a sweet potato. And the sweet potatoes uh, were grown in uh, South and Central America and in the Caribbean. Uh, and they just kind of moved up into uh, North America as, uh, well, I guess pre-Columbian times actually. And then uh, by the time the uh, Europeans and the Africans started arriving. Uh, we uh, started growing them here just because it was a really well adapted uh, vegetable. Sweet potatoes are a lot more nutritious than Irish potatoes and uh, they don't get as many diseases. Uh, the, the edible structure of the sweet potato is actually uh, botanically a root whereas the edible structure of a Irish potato is the is called a tuber. But uh, we've done some uh, genetic studies on sweet potato in 
uh, recent years, and we are, are now not too terribly sure that uh, sweet potatoes didn't originate in Asia somehow, and uh, how they made it to uh, South America and parts of the Pacific, we are really unsure of at this time. Really heat tolerant vegetable. Uh, you really don't even plant these until, uh, you know, about late May, early June. They do fairly well on poor soil, but you always get a response uh, when you apply potassium to the soil for sweet potatoes. Now, the way sweet potatoes are grown, uh, you will actually do what's called bed these roots in a bed and uh, it's generally covered in sawdust or uh, uh, something like that on outside. And then you'll get a lot of sprouting from these uh, roots. They will send up adventitious shoots. And as those shoots grow up through that uh, uh, sawdust or media or bark or whatever it is you put them in, they will start to form roots. And as they emerge, you can go in there and harvest those uh, shoots, which are called slips, and you can take them to the field and plant them, and uh, they'll just uh, just grow and do really well. You can also also grow them from vine cuttings. Uh, you take the cuttings and uh, stick them in the ground, and they'll root in two days. So uh, let's move on a little bit. Sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family, as you can see by this bloom. They do bloom occasionally, and uh, the flowers are actually, uh, if they get pollinated, they will actually result in true seed. Uh, since uh, sweet potatoes are vegetatively propagated, there's not a lot of variation uh, at, at all. Uh, when You know, if you uh, bed the potatoes that you grew last year and get the slips or the vine cuttings, you'll have the same sweet potatoes you grew uh, last year. So the only way to um, get a different kind of sweet potato or improve the sweet potato is through the flowers and through uh, control crosses or chance seedlings. But uh, keep in mind that true seed uh, is produced in the flowers. But we uh, we don't use true seed to plant sweet potatoes. We we plant the slips and uh, uh, harvest roots. Uh, when uh, Booker T. Washington came to Macon County, Alabama, to uh, start Tuskegee Institute, the average sweet potato yield in Macon County was about 45 bushels per acre. Uh, nowadays. Uh, Farmers that uh, uh, that are doing this for a living uh, are reaching yields somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 500 bushels per acre. So we've really made some really good advances. We've got some disease resistance bred into the sweet potato crop now. Uh, it's a really good uh, good uh, crop for some parts of the state. Most of our sweet potato production now is in uh, the Cullman area and down in uh, Baldwin County area, so north and south. Uh, like I said, they are more nutritious than Irish potatoes. They're easier to grow. They're very versatile. The uh, sweet potato uh, was used here as a pie base instead of pumpkins, where uh, up north you had pumpkin pie in the fall. Well, here in the uh, southeast, you, you use the sweet potato for the same thing. And a family story that I remember uh, being told uh, that uh, my grandfather, who was a World War I veteran, uh, grew up on a farm down in Hale County, Alabama, and the sweet potatoes came in one year and uh, apparently it was a really good year and they they really did well and my great-grandmother uh, baked a whole sweet potato pie for every member of the family so when they came in for supper that night there was a whole sweet potato pie sitting at the table 
where everybody sat down and she it just really tickled her to see the reaction with everybody so uh you know it was uh, uh, uh just uh, uh that's and i'm gonna share some other family stories coming along as we go through this the varieties that we grow commercially now uh are things like Evangeline, Covington, and Beauregard. Some of the older varieties like Jewel and Puerto Rico, uh, you can find those still uh, uh, through some plant supply places. Uh, and we do have a list of uh, sweet potato uh, supply, uh, you know, sweet potato plant suppliers. Uh, so uh, anyway, one interesting thing about uh, sweet potatoes, uh, USDA maintains a seed bank uh, throughout the uh, United States and, and, and uh, some of the territories and, and dependencies around. And they have a, um, they have a collection of sweet potatoes. Uh, I think it numbers up into uh, the thousands of different varieties that they have. Uh, but they are stored, you know, uh, you've got a perishable root there. So if you're going to store something, uh, you, ne you need to, uh, you know, make sure that it's not perishable. Uh, but the way they store the sweet potatoes is uh, in test tubes. Uh, they grow them uh, in vitro. That's a, just a big name for uh, growing plants in test tubes. So when you order uh, a uh, sweet potato variety from them for breeding purposes or whatever they will have to take that out of the test tubes and grow the slips for you uh, and that's the way they send them to you is uh, little, little small vine cuttings and I have ordered a few like that before but hadn't done it lately all right let's move on to uh, another plant that uh, is uh, very widely grown in the south and probably not very popular in any other parts of the country unless you've got people that grew up in the south and have moved somewhere else they will grow okra uh, where they where they've gone to just because they know what to do with it okra is uh, a very warm season uh, a member of the hibiscus family and we eat the immature pods that's that's what we eat uh, it's native to ethiopia and we think maybe india uh, okra is one of the most productive vegetables i think you can grow because it will start bearing and will will continue to bear all summer long and the only thing that will stop it from bearing is when you get a freeze in the fall and that just that kills the plant and <clears throat> you know you'll have to start over but uh, you need to have really warm soil before you plant the okra seed it is a hibiscus and uh, so uh, you know you'd plant it uh, uh, maybe after you planted some of the other earlier vegetables uh, we've actually got some really good hybrid okra now uh, that's just uh, where they've gone in and done some selective braiding uh, one of the ones that we've grown here in Alabama is Jambalaya. There was also one called Cajun Delight. We've grown Zara and Gumbo. Uh, gumbo is actually an African word. It means okra. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. We got a lot of words from Africa. Uh, you know, uh, the I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but, uh, you know, uh, peanuts. Uh, sometimes you you hear peanuts called goober peas. Well, goober or gooba is an African word for peanut. And uh, although peanuts are native to South America, uh, they got they made their way to Africa at some point in time. And then uh, when the uh, the African Americans were brought over uh, as as slaves, they they brought okra with them and and their language. The old varieties of okra that we used to grow like, well, we still grow Clemson Spineless and, and some of these other ones, uh, cow horn, there's a red velvet okra that we grow. Uh, Clemson Spineless is, a, is an open pollinated, you can actually save seed from, from these open pollinated varieties. 
but Clemson spineless is uh, 60 days from from planting till harvest, whereas something like uh, jambalaya or zara is 48 days. So you know you can uh, plant early and get your plants out as soon as you can and maybe have okra before anybody else has okra with these uh, with these hybrids and if you uh, we've got some people that are uh, trying it by growing it uh, starting it in a greenhouse and plant planting it out in a high tunnel very early in the spring you know way earlier than you would normally plant it but since they're in that protected structure they're having okra, you know, sometimes six weeks before anybody else has it. And fresh okra, uh, you can just about name your price. Uh, and uh, the restaurants are, will buy it. Uh, and so uh, when everybody else's okra starts coming in, then you can cut yours down and uh, go do something else. You've already made your money. So that's just kind of interesting fact about how we do these hybrids. We we grew these hybrids side by side uh, one year at uh, the experiment station at Bell Mina. And uh, as you can see here on the first picture on the left, uh, you can see how much more vigorous and earlier the jambalaya is compared to the Clemson spineless. Uh, similarly, uh, the picture on the right is Zara by by Clemson Spineless. It, it is also uh, early to emerge and maybe will germinate a little better in a little cooler soil. That could be one of the what reasons it's uh, so much earlier, but it, it is uh, really interesting to see the contrast. And another thing about this hybrid okra, uh, you know, the pods uh, need to be a certain size. If they get too big, traditionally, uh, they get tough. Well, these hybrid okras, let's say you miss a day or two picking, uh, you go back and, you know, you've got a real long, huge pod that you would normally throw away. Well, the hybrids are still tender and you can still use those, but, uh, you know, taking them to the market, people are just, uh, they know what okra is and they like a certain size. All right, you remember the picture of Mr. Perkins and Mr. Uh, Andrews in uh, Cottondale where I grew up. This is that same place in, in about 1925. Uh, that area was known as the Company Field. And uh, the people that uh, lived in Cottondale, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how they worked it out. Maybe they rented the property or else uh, somebody was designated to, to farm the place for a little while. Uh, notice that this corn, uh, notice the wide spacing between the plants in the row. Now that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is uh, before hybrid corn and you know this was, uh, this was corn that you had saved down through the years and uh, you know, just uh, planted it every year. Uh, another interesting story uh, about uh, corn uh, is one that my great grandfather told my grandfather. He told me. Uh, so this story is about 150 years old, give or take. Uh, is about a couple of neighbors, and uh, one of them had run out of corn, and he asked his neighbor if he could borrow some corn till his his corn came in. And of course. Uh, the neighbor said, sure, you know, come on over and, and get the corn. And uh, so when the neighbor came to get the corn in his wagon, he had his sideboards up on his wagon. And uh, so they loaded the corn and the neighbor went on back. Well, uh, when the neighbor's corn came in, uh, he remembered his, uh, his deal with the, the, the other neighbor and, uh, you know, brought him uh, corn out of his patch to repay him but uh, when he came to repay in his wagon he didn't have the sideboards up so uh, the neighbor sort of felt a little cheated there uh, so <laughs> just kind of interesting uh, how that goes but it's important to 
to remember this spacing here because I'm going to tell you something about how these things worked way back there. We grew up uh, when I was coming up on white field corn. We didn't know what sweet corn was. Uh, we, we planted the white corn. It was, uh, we would go in and, and uh, harvest uh, when the uh, ears got big enough to uh, harvest in the milk stage, just like you would uh, nowadays with sweet corn. We would harvest the white corn, white field corn, and, and uh, my grandmother would bring it in and uh, we'd have what's called a corn day. We'd, we'd pick all the corn, and, uh, or, or, or at least most of it anyway, and she'd start cutting it. I, I, would, I would shuck it and silk it, and then she would take, uh, take a knife and cut it off of the cob and put it in a, a freezer container and freeze it. And uh, when you got ready to cook it, you would take that uh, container of corn out and get a black iron skillet and uh, put a little butter in that skillet and uh, put that corn in that skillet and you'd fry it. Now that's a, that's a different vegetable from sweet corn. Uh, it, it, uh, if you did that with sweet corn, you'd end up with cream corn, which is basically what we were doing, but because field corn has a much higher starch content, uh, the result was a, a different type of vegetable. It had a different texture, it had a different taste, uh, and it was just really, really good. Uh, this particular variety right here is an old, ancient variety. It's called Mexican June. Uh, my grandparents grew this on the farm down in Hale County, uh, back before World War I. Uh, so uh, just kind of, uh, and I remember buying seed uh, way back when I'd go to town with my grandmother. Uh, we'd go to the seed place and we would buy this, this variety. And you know, you, you'd see sweet corn there for sale. And I, I, I remember asking my grandmother one time, I said, grandmother, how come we don't uh, plant some of this? And she said, oh, oh no, 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 Let, we, we want this other. So, you know, it was, uh, we, we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> I, you know, we, we do now, but uh, it was just uh, a, a different uh, way of thinking, I guess. Uh, the open pollinated white corn, uh, like I said, we used it in the milk stage and fried it. It was just really great. <laughs> One of the uh, illicit uses for white corn uh, the best of the best moonshine used white corn, and the way they did that back then, they would uh, they would malt the corn. They would actually sprout it, uh, and then dry it. And then, if you took it to the mill to get it ground, you had to make sure the miller uh, was aware of your activities and would keep it confidential because if he was grinding uh, corn that had been sprouted or malted. Uh, there wasn't but any one one reason to do that, and that was to make whiskey with it. Uh, you would mix that in with uh, uh, ground corn, and the sprouted corn has some enzymes in it that uh, uh, turn the starch into sugar, fermentable sugar, and that's that's how that works. Uh, we've recently discovered, uh, now that we've got the DNA technology and can sequence the genomes of uh, some of these things that uh, a lot of our old southeastern corn varieties are, you know, cl very closely related to or exact copies of some of those uh, varieties that are still grown in parts of Mexico. And it, uh, you know, you kind of go uh, get to thinking, well, how did that come about? And remember that uh, we... Uh, fought a war with Mexico back in the 1840s and uh, of course you know the, the the army took uh their horses and mules and livestock down to Mexico with them and uh you know I'm not certain that uh some of this corn didn't come back in some feed sacks after the war um uh, but uh you know it, it, there's no way to prove that is the way it happened there was quite a bit of trading back and forth anyway, even in 
uh, pre-Columbian times, the uh, Native Americans had started farming here in the southeast uh, uh, six, seven thousand years ago. So, and and they grew corn and beans and uh, pumpkins and squash and things like that. Uh, they also grew uh, bottle gourds, and they have found some bottle gourds in some sites that are around 8,000 years old. So uh, that's uh, kind of interesting. Anson Mills in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, has gone back and tried to rescue some of these heirloom uh, grains and rice products. Uh, there's a whole unique culture over on the uh, coast of South Carolina and Georgia and down into Florida a little bit. It's called uh, Sea Islands. Uh, and that, uh, that culture there is uh, uh, very reminiscent of uh, the homeland of Africa. I mean, there's the, the people speak a, a dialect of English that is unique. It's called Gullah. Uh, but that, uh, that low country and those sea islands, uh, they preserved a lot of the old ways. Uh, uh, some of the things that they've been able to rescue are uh, things like a purple straw wheat, which is a, uh, a soft white winter wheat that's high in protein. Uh, and it's used for cakes, biscuits, and pastries. Uh, and, you know, they've, they've rescued that, and there, there's some, uh, they've done some seed increases, uh, and uh, people are growing it now. There's also a, a corn that uh, is very similar to uh, Bloody Butcher, but it's a unique uh, red corn they call Jimmy Red Corn. And uh, it was almost extinct, and they, they found it, and they, they started growing that again. There's some uh, Sea Island red peas. We're going to talk about peas in depth, but the peas I'm talking about right now, these kind of peas are uh, referred to as cow peas or southern peas, or, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a, it's a different kind of pea uh, altogether from the... Uh, green round English pea. They also grow sesame over there and uh, they call it Benny, which is a direct African word for sesame and uh, they still make what's called a Benny cake over there. Uh, it's an interesting culture. So let's talk about southern peas. Uh, uh, the cow pea, the southern pea, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was a, uh, a legume vegetable that you could eat uh, the peas. It does really well on poor soil. Uh, it, uh, there were just lots and lots and lots of different varieties. And these peas came from West Africa. This is another import uh, uh, from Africa, another gift. And uh, there's a lot of variation in the, in the peas. Uh, this is just some old peas that I grew one year, a uh, uh, red ripper and a uh, speckled purple hull and the lady peas. Now my grandmother grew the lady peas and she saved her seed. What she would do, <clears throat> uh, she would harvest the pods after they dried and she'd leave them in the pod and she'd put all that in an onion sack and uh, she'd hang it. Uh, from the ceiling in the corner of a bedroom and uh, the reason she kept them in the pod was because uh, the weevils and uh, things didn't bother them as bad while they were still in the hole and then the next spring when she got ready to uh, plant she would uh, shell those out and get the seed and plant them again um, <clears throat> it, the, the lady pea is a cream type pea it's a little bitty pea uh, so anyway, uh, the, there's a lot of different, a lot of variation in the, in the peas. There's four main types. Uh, basically there's a crowder pea, a black eye or pink eye type, and a cream pea. Uh, what people are 
drawn to and what they're used to nowadays is just a pink eye purple hull pea. And there's a lot of different cultivars of uh, pink eye purple hull. And uh, some of them include uh, top pick, there's a pink eye purple hull, uh, cow pea mosaic virus resistant pea. Uh, Mississippi pink eye two is a new variety. Uh, and cornet. Uh, now there's also, we also grew black eye peas and you can go to the store uh, and buy a bag of black eye peas off the shelf and you can plant those and they'll produce black eye peas. Now I will say this, uh, the black eye pea, uh, we always considered it to be a lot harder to grow not really harder to grow, but it was uh, the, well, the the bugs got in them uh, real bad. So I guess uh, the Capi Curculio, which is uh, more the major pest of uh, uh, southern peas now, uh, would uh, would really tear up the uh, black eyes. Uh, again, uh, here's another gift from Africa. Uh, there, there may also be some peas that are native to India. And what was so good about this, uh, this vegetable is that they would do well on poor soils. And they still grow. This is a very important crop in West Africa. And they've had some pest problems over there as well. And they're actually growing uh, some transgenic or... Uh, 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 you know, genetically engineered peas that are, they've incorporated some genes into that crop now that uh, make the peas resistance to their major insect pest. But, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I mentioned the USDA seed bank a while back. If you go on their website and type in Vigna unguiculata, and I won't spell that because I don't, you know, but that's that's how you do the search. It'll pull up like almost 10,000 different uh, uh, collection uh, of varieties that they've collected and are storing. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, <clears throat> but you can go back and find a uh, old whippoorwill pea, a, a one called blue goose. There was, uh, you know, just a lot of different. Uh, peas and you know if you're out in the middle of nowhere in the south uh, and you're saving your seed a lot of times every farm would have a different pea or a different corn uh, you know it just it's it's the way things worked out <clears throat> but there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, well I guess you know when uh, people did trade back and forth and would uh, would get uh, uh, new new varieties from time to time. Now peas, some of the peas have a really rank vining growth habit. Remember back uh, when I showed you the cornfield, how far the corn in the row was spaced apart? Well, what we would do a lot of times <clears throat> when we went through and plowed the corn for the last time and, and did, you know, that would, you, that's what's called lay-by. At that point in time, you would come back in and plant some of these vining peas in the skips. And the corn stalks would act as a support for those pea vines. Uh, you go in and pull your roasting ears when they got ready. <clears throat> go back and pick peas and then uh, pick peas several times. And then when fall came and the corn dried down, you went and got the uh, corn and, uh, it uh, you know, uh, took it to the mill and had it ground. And that white corn made cornmeal and grits. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, had another uh, uh, vegetable used for, for white corn. And I'll tell you about in a little bit. But uh, that... Uh, Plant, planting the peas in the skips, uh, here's, a, here's a real example. This is Mr. Benjamin J. Carr 
uh, Macon County, Alabama. He's in his cornfield, but look where he's standing. He's standing by the pea vines, and look at those peas that are on that vine. And I'm sure the reason this picture was taken is because he was awful proud of that. Uh, this, uh, this is a family portrait uh, from way back up, uh, 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 and it just kind of demonstrates how, how things were done uh, back in the old days. So you got your peas, you got your cornmeal that you can make cornbread, uh, and maybe some peppers or something else. So this, this is a meal right here. What I remember about growing up at, during this time, you know, I, I told you that everybody had a big garden. Uh, I, I remember some people, some of our neighbors, uh, well, some neighbors in particular uh, that I remember, the Spencers. Uh, they were, they grew up on a farm down in Hale County, just, uh, just abject poverty, uh, just really hard times growing up. Uh, uh, Mr. Spencer was making 50 cents a day farming. And he moved, his wife and whole fam the whole family, they moved from Hale County up to Tuscaloosa County so he could go to work in a foundry to make 75 cents a day. And they grew two or three huge gardens every year. And he always had a cornfield to go with it. Uh, they, uh, they kept chickens. They'd have a few hogs every once in a while. And uh, just, uh, you know, just th th they didn't buy a lot of, uh, of groceries. Uh, when they would come to shop, they would buy sugar and coffee and tea uh, and uh, dairy products. Uh, they didn't have a cow. Or maybe they had one uh, back on the farm, but uh, when they moved to Tuscaloosa, I don't ever remember them having a cow. But listen, everybody worked. Everybody worked the garden. Everybody, uh, the dogs <laughs> didn't even get to live free. You know, the dogs all had a job, and uh, if that dog wasn't doing his job, he'd get traded off or sold or something. Uh, and so you, uh, you know, everything had a purpose. Uh, Mr. Spencer had maybe, one time I remember he had like maybe 300 chickens. And it always kind of, uh, I wondered about that for a long time, and uh, why did they have so many chickens? Well, they ate them. <laughs> they ate the chickens. They uh, fished and always had a freezer full of fish. Miss Spencer, uh, when they would, when the peas would come in, you know, they'd shell the peas and have fresh peas and they'd freeze them or can them or whatever. And she wouldn't even throw the hulls away. She would make jelly out of pea hulls, pea hull jelly. That's a real thing, honest to goodness. I've had it, and it's not too bad on a hot biscuit. Uh, but they were just, uh, they were wonderful people, and they, uh, they, they were uh, echoes of the way things used to be. So, <clears throat> here's something else that was a extremely important crop for us here in the southeast. Uh, one of the reasons it was so important is because you can grow turnip greens almost year round here in Alabama. They don't do well in the hot summer time, but uh, you can plant them in the fall and pick them all winter and all spring, maybe plant a little early crop in the spring and have a few. Uh, and of course we had collards and kale and uh, they were just, uh, it was a really, really good crop for us. You can eat the turnips of course, an interesting thing about turnips, uh, turnips are, uh, these, these crops, these uh, crucifer crops, the greens, the collards, the cabbages, the broccoli, the cauliflower, things like that, are native to Europe. And uh, over in Ireland, uh, they grow turnips, uh, but uh, they eat the turnip. They throw the top into the... Uh, cow pen and let the cows eat the tops, but they eat the turnips. Uh, now here we eat 
both the tops and the turnips. And one interesting thing about the turnips, uh, in Ireland, uh, they carve uh, jack-o'-lanterns out of turnips. Uh, they didn't have pumpkins, so that was the traditional carving uh, uh, thing that they would do it, uh, during Halloween would be to carve turnips. Uh, collards, uh, really important crop. Uh, uh, what's the difference between a collard and a cabbage? Well, a collard's just a cabbage that doesn't form a head. And uh, kale uh, is a leafy green, a lot like collards. Uh, up here in the Tennessee Valley, people would plant turnips and kale together. Now back home down in West Alabama, we planted turnips and uh, mustard. And we'd always have a little mustard in with the turnips or next to the turnips and we'd mix them together sometimes. Uh, the turnip, uh, the, the Remember I mentioned the, the cornmeal. <clears throat> well, my grandmother used to do something that uh, I've only seen a couple of people do uh, since then. Uh, when she would cook a mess of turnip greens and uh, she would she'd cook the greens and once they got uh, done, she would take the, the turnip greens, the greens out of the pot and put them into another bowl or vessel of some kind and she'd uh, leave the the pot liquor in 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 the pot where she'd cook the greens well if you get that pot liquor boiling make up a kind of a stiff batter with that home ground cornmeal and hot water uh, if you want to you can cut up an onion in it and uh, you can make out a little uh, uh, dumpling and drop it into that uh, pot liquor and cook it. Now, boy, you talking about good? Those uh, that was uh, what we call meal dumplings. I think over in Georgia they called them corn dodgers, uh, but we we just referred to them as uh, cornmeal dumplings, and they were really good. Uh, that way, you got everything out of the turnip top. You ate the greens, you ate the pot liquor, you ate the corn that was cooked in the pot liquor and nothing went to waste uh, and so just a really uh, unique use for collards and well we we would cook collards a little different uh, and then uh, they, they were always good so uh, I've already mentioned that uh, collard just a cabbage that doesn't form a head and it's a really important commercial crop for some of us now too. Uh, one of my co-workers mentioned the other day about broccoli. Well, you can eat the leaves, the head, the stems. Uh, you can you can do a lot with, with broccoli. You could probably do the same thing with uh, collards. Also, if you know what sauerkraut is, that's a uh, cabbage uh, cut up and fermented uh, to make sauerkraut. Well, you can also make sauerkraut out of collards, and it's really good. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, uh, uh, if you ever get a chance and have uh, an abundance of collards, uh, try, try making a little sauerkraut out of the collards. So the turnip greens that we grew uh, were primarily the what a variety called purple top white globe. And uh, that purple top turnip, uh, you take a bundle of turnips to the farmer's market, it better have that turnip on it with that, that purple top. That's what everybody's used to. That's what they look for. Now we do have some hybrids uh, that are really productive. Uh, there's one hybrid turnip that uh, doesn't even form a turnip. It just, it just forms the leaves. Uh, and it's it's really productive and you can maximize your production uh, that way and I mentioned that uh, here they planted uh, turnips with uh, kale and back home they planted it with mustard now this is a picture of my great-granddaddy and my granddaddy uh, my granddaddy's a little boy sitting there on that stack of lumber uh, he was born in 1899, uh, and so he would have been about maybe six or seven years old when this picture was taken. 
But notice the, the oxen there and how poor they are. And uh, you, you, can, you can count the ribs. I mean, these, these, this was hard times. Uh, and if you didn't grow it or uh, 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 make it, then you didn't use it. Granddad told me a story one time. He said that his dad got sick and wasn't able to uh, work for a while. And the way he put it, he said the cupboard got a little bare. And I, what he was telling me was that he and his sisters and his brother and their mom and, and other family members got hungry. I mean, there's not many people nowadays that knows what real hunger is. But my granddaddy did remember a time when he, he was absolutely hungry. Well, he said a neighbor uh, invited them over to pick turnip greens. And so they went over and started picking turnip greens. And granddaddy said for a while there, they ate turnip greens for three meals a day. Uh, breakfast, dinner, and supper. And uh, when, when he told me that story, I just, I just you know, it sounded just far-fetched, but I asked him, I said, Granted, how does uh, turnip greens taste for breakfast? And he said, pretty good. So, uh, you know, if you're hungry, you, uh, you do what you have to do. And a lot of this culture is recorded for us in some different books of uh, this is one of the books uh, that was written back in the uh, 60s, early 70s. Uh, the, the, uh, the book is a, just a bunch of historical facts and pictures about how people used to live way back. Uh, this is an extremely uh, good book about that kind of culture. Now, the, the people that it's written about were the people that settled in the uh, southern Appalachians, uh, in the mountains, uh, North Georgia in particular for this book, and western North Carolina. But that same group of people came here uh, that uh, after uh, the War of 1812 and the defeat of the uh, Red Stick Creek Indians, uh, a lot of land was opened up uh, in Alabama, and there was a mass migration from the Carolinas and from Georgia and Tennessee and Virginia. Uh, they called it Alabama fever. There were just thousands of people, just streams of wagons coming into the, to the state. Uh, and uh, some of these people that came uh, were... Um, Revolutionary War veterans or uh, War of 1812 veterans, and that's how the government paid them for their service. They gave them land, and that's how some of my people got here. Uh, some of my family's been here since 1816. That's over 200 years. Uh, and uh, that particular ancestor was uh, born in what is now Northern Ireland. Uh, he fought in the revolution and South Carolina, migrated to Tennessee afterwards, and then uh, in 1816 came to Alabama and actually named and founded the town of Havana, which is now in Hale County. Uh, his closest uh, neighbors at the time were Native Americans, and uh, periodically he would have to go back to Tennessee from time to time and uh, left her with the family and and the servants and uh, the Indians would come and trade uh, and she was scared of them and so she didn't want to make them mad or anything and they brought honey wrapped in deer skins and they at, at the, one particular story uh, when he got back home the Indians had traded her out of everything she had except the clothes she was wearing. So he had to more or less start over, and uh, they uh, uh, made do. But anyway, uh, I hope I've uh, given you a little picture of uh, uh, life in the South and uh, 
maybe this will encourage you to uh, look at some hard times and maybe think, well, maybe these ain't so hard after all. So I've enjoyed this and uh, uh, I wish you the very best and uh, good luck.